the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Anarchism, Marxism, and the Right to the City by Hamish Callan. The right to the city, as a slogan, a demand, and a body of intellectual work, calls for a radically democratic city. It comes from the work of Henri Lefebvre, French philosopher, Marxist, sociologist, flamboyant revolutionary, from a short piece that came out in 1968, that canonical year in left-wing mythology. The right to the city is an appealing idea because it promises to unite disparate urban struggles on a whole range of issues, from anti-gentrification activism to reclaim the streets marches, community gardens to housing co-ops, anti-police violence campaigns to the fight for better public transport, and so on, into some kind of radical whole, a vision that coalesces around the demand for a city that is more substantially controlled by those who live in it. It is also an ambiguous mantra, one that has meant very different things to very different people. In my own discipline, geography, it is most often encountered as a kind of catch-all phrase that brings struggles over space to the forefront. Who has the right to be where? And how do they fight for that right in a city that seems ever more inhospitable to those without money or status, where the right to be in space and shape its contours is so heavily policed and so highly priced? It is also, if we're concerned with intellectual genealogies, a Marxist idea, and not only because it comes from the mind of an avowed, although somewhat unorthodox, Marxist. At its simplest, Lefebvre was spatialising the labour theory of value. If Marx believed that workers create value through their work, Lefebvre believed that those who live in cities create the city through living in it. We produce space socially. That might sound a bit vague or politically wispy, but in Lefebvre's conceptual city, we need to think of the work of urbanisation not only as the physical acts of building, laying bricks and pouring concrete and raising cranes and so on, but also all those continuous acts of social existence and interaction that make cities more than simply a pile of empty buildings, take out the messiness of life in all its diversity, and the city dies. And partly why this lens seems to resonate so solidly in the 21st century 50 years after it was coined, is that we seem to see the city dying all around us. In the displacement of whole communities, the generalisation of gentrification and speculation, the proliferation of hostile architecture, the privatisation of public space, and the rollout of zero-tolerance policing, a tightly woven pincer movement of financialization and authoritarianism seems to squeeze the richness of human life out of urban centres, leaving in its wake a sanitised, commodified, securitized version of our cities, which is then advertised back to us for rent. And so the demand for a right to the city resonates, because like Marx's labour theory of value, it seeks the power in this formula. If we make the city, we should control the city. If we belong to the city, it should belong to us. All of this comes together under the aegis of a supposedly Marxist theory, because as Lefebvre so audaciously argued, the city, or the process of urbanisation, now makes up an increasingly large slice of the productive pie, 
Put another way, capitalism makes an awful lot of money through the city, both as a site and an object of consumption. To make that a little bit less abstract, it is estimated that real estate's combined value is now worth around three and a half times more than global GDP. And whilst the cheerleaders of urban growth celebrate the fact that over 50% of the world's population now live in cities, that also means that a huge chunk of the productive, by which I mean profitably exploited labour that makes up capitalism on a global scale, takes place in cities. Controlling the city, then, becomes more than a demand for a more democratic neighbourhood enclave, but becomes the demand for a more democratic capitalism, which is almost certainly impossible, and so needs to be seen more radically for what it was always intended to be, a demand for a world liberated from capitalism, or perhaps more specifically, a world made up of cities whose inhabitants would liberate themselves from capitalism. But importantly, for Lefebvre, the right to the city was the demand for a more democratic communism as much as it was the demand for a more democratic city. You build one with the other in his imagination. The right to the city was a rejection not only of capitalist urbanisation, but also statist urbanisation, which reached its horrifying extremity in the dead hand of Stalinism and its ubiquity in the stultifying bureaucracy of the tightly managed city. It was a rejection of the mentality that saw space as empty, exchangeable, measured by its potential for development. Space as seen through the distant eyes of the state, the planner, the speculator, whose schemes would be enacted on and rarely by the people they affected. This gets me to my central point for today. The right to the city may not be an anarchist idea in the identitarian sense of where or who it comes from, but it is deeply compatible with an anarchist vision of what the city could and should be. As long ago as 1978, the geographer G.M. Horner noted that the link between Lefebvre's work and anarchist ideas deserved more than the passing acknowledgement it has so far received. But four decades later, it still hasn't. What might it mean to think of the right to the city and anarchism together? The anarchistic elements of the right to the city are, I want to suggest, no mere intellectual curiosity, but rather a fundamental to the continued relevance of both the right to the city and potentially anarchism. I'm going to try and show that in the rest of this little talk. I'm going to do it from four angles framed by four words, time, scale, power, and agency. Let's go. First, time, or more specifically, revolutionary time. The urbanist Edward Sawyer once wrote, but in my first meeting with Lefebvre in 1978, I clumsily asked him, Are you an anarchist? He responded politely, No, not now. Well then, I said, What are you now? He smiled, A Marxist, of course, so that we can all be anarchists sometime in the future. Now this is a joke but it reveals what Lefebvre saw as an irreconcilable difference between his standpoint and anarchism, what we might call strategic timing. On multiple occasions, Lefebvre dismissed the anarchists for being too hasty, their grand ideals squandered by a petulant desire for all or nothing now. This is a familiar dismissal, it's been replayed countless times since the split of the First International, but it misconstrues its target. The anarchist conception of revolutionary timing is immediate in a practical sense. Start now, in your daily life, in your workplace, without waiting for the saviour of the Grand Revolution, a merciful state, or the teleological crisis of capital reaching its mythical endpoint. But it is not immediate in an ideological sense. Capitalism, racism, 
patriarchy, the state, and so on, are not structures of oppression that can be shrugged off in one grandiose sweep. They must be reconquered anew in each social interaction. Now, insofar as there is a singular anarchist concept of revolution, it posits a permanent transition. Revolution is not a temporally or spatially singular event. What are we to make of Stuart Eldon's bizarre claim from his book Understanding Henri Lefebvre that the anarchist aim of the end of the state and with it the abolition of private property is laudable, but this cannot be achieved overnight. Find me a sober anarchist who thinks it can. This matters because Lefebvre conceptualises revolutionary time in ways that are actually very similar to the anarchists, even if he was too busy trading in stereotypes to see this or admit it. The right to the city is a vision in which, to quote Lefebvre, society as a whole takes over the functions previously performed by the state, a sentiment straight out of the playbook of Colin Ward. In Andy Merrifield's words, Lefebvre's vision introduces its own antithesis of the state through direct action, and it does so gradually, and it does so beginning now. This is strikingly apparent in pretty much all the things that scholars of the right to the city hail as examples of it in action, which are, for want of a less loaded word, prefigurative in the sense that they seek to carve out spaces within capitalism to fight for space in the here and now. It is, I think, precisely because the grandiose final revolution, the storming of the new Winter Palace, is no longer really imaginable that the right to the city is a popular idea, because it encourages us to see hope in smaller acts that might coalesce. This is a future that is near at hand and far away simultaneously. To express my point more explicitly, I believe that the right to the city mirrors the work of many 20th century anarchists in blurring the line between reformism and revolution, not to sap the radical intentions of the latter, but to strip it of some of its messianic overtones, overtones which so easily become authoritarian. Second, scale. Implicit in what I've just said is a sense of revolution that cannot happen everywhere all at once. Now that might seem pretty obvious, but it means that the right to the city also begins to resemble anarchist principles in spatial terms, where the city becomes the site of politics in part because it is smaller than the nation, the empire, or the world. And in this city are all those myriad struggles which the idea of a right to the city seeks to unite, which are smaller still. Now, smallness is sometimes taken to mean less politically important. And, of course, it often can be, when smallness is fetishised as somehow innately more virtuous or pursued as an autonomous end goal, the tiny utopia gated off from the burning world. But the right to the city invites us to see how the small and the big are tightly connected. Change enough small things and you might well have changed the big thing too. To put that in less wishy-washy terms, let's take the example of housing. Against Friedrich Engel's suggestion that we cannot overcome the housing question until we've overcome capitalism, the right to the city invites us to explore forms of housing that are decommodified or held in common, that carve out spaces away from the domination of the state and the market. And that flips the strategic order of priority because it becomes something we do now because it is something we need now. There are striking similarities here with the work of Colin Ward, whose rejection of thinking big in planning terms was pitched in such a different register to Lefebvre's work that mirrors so many of its ideas. There are echoes also of Murray Bookchin's work on libertarian municipalism. There are traces of the Kropotkian principle of federating localities rather than vesting power into a centralized state. The principle of revolution underpinning the vision of each of these ideals 
is where I think this similarity stems from, because it reaches from the small to the big and not the other way around. Third, power. In 1986, towards the end of his life, Lefebvre co-authored an entry for the competition to design the new Belgrade, capital of the then communist state of Yugoslavia. As Neil Smith notes, this document is remarkable for two reasons. First, it is an example of Lefebvre's rare interaction with making plans, though it was a plan that refused to do what respectable plans are expected to do, namely prescribe a predetermined future, and was thus rejected at the first stage of the competition. But second, and probably more importantly, here his political priority is rendered with unusual clarity. Autogesture, a word that always sounds a bit awkward to pronounce in English, but you'll have to live with it. The right to the city was autogestion as a strategy of organisation at the city's scale. And what is autogestion? Well, it translates somewhat awkwardly as self-management, but it is basically workers' control. As a vision of an anti-statist communism, this brought the theory and praxis of anarchism and autonomous forms of Marxism very close to each other, even whilst conversation between the two remained minimal. As it turned out, the hope for a more democratic communism in Yugoslavia was rapidly fading away by the early 1970s. Power was re-centralised to regional elites, with nationalisation subsuming the project of democratisation. Observing this, Lefebvre restated his priority with even greater clarity. A state that proclaims autogestion from above, he wrote in 1978, paralyzes it by this mere fact and converts it into its opposite. The movement comes from below, he went on to argue, or it does not come at all. The anarchist Daniel Gurin, reflecting on Yugoslavia at the same time, reached a very similar conclusion, as we would expect him to. In short, the right to the city in Lefebvre's hands was explicitly about building counterpower to the state outside the institutions of the state through the generalization of the principle of workers' control. Fourth, and finally, agency, which in Marxist terms means more specifically which people have the capacity to change the course of history. The anarchists have always had a pretty fluid answer to that, anyone who wants to. We could approach this historically. I'm thinking of Chris Elam's wonderful book on anarchism in the city, focused on Barcelona in the 1930s. Beholden to a rigid understanding of class, the communists would organise only with those in the ranks of the organised industrial labour force, whilst the anarchists would organise with anyone oppressed by reality as it was. That meant workers in the classical sense, but it also meant sex workers, street traders, homeless people, criminals, a broad section of the urban population that dragged open the concept of revolutionary agency. Or I think of Benedict Anderson's curious book, Under Three Flags, which charts the movement of anarchism as an ideological current, always more genuinely international than Marxism, by virtue of that same fluidity. You didn't need to fit into any specific identity to take up the ideal. You just needed to believe in its principles of freedom and equality. But more importantly still, we could leave that history aside for a minute. We could leave the realm of theory and hit the streets of any contemporary city. There isn't really a communist party left to lead the ranks. There aren't really any ranks. Instead, there are a legion of intersecting social struggles. If, as David Harvey of all people invites us to imagine, the right to the city belongs to all of those who produce space, then we need a concept of revolutionary agency 
that bursts out from any neat categories of class. Let me draw this to a close. I've tried to show that the anarchistic elements of the right to the city matter, and insofar as I've shown that the city matters, I hope I've shown how maybe the right to the city matters to anarchism. This is what keeps the right to the city from becoming another moribund buzzword in the slogan vaults of the ruling class. And it doesn't mean that the right to the city, still less its author, is anarchist. Rather, that if we take its principles openly and honestly and without any kind of ideological blinkers on, it seems to me that we should at very least be able to have a discussion about the right to the city and anarchism in the same breath. Like seeds beneath the snow, to use Colin Ward's phrase, it doesn't necessarily matter if we label these principles this or that. They are what they are, and they're going to exist whether we theorise them or not. I'll leave the last word to Monsieur Henri Lefebvre himself. The purpose of the struggle is to go beyond democracy and beyond the democratic state, to build a society without state power. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.